Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for January 31st, 2021. We are beginning a new unit uh, this this Sunday, and uh, it's Unit 3, which is entitled The Call of Women. The Call of Women. We are in Lesson 9 for the quarter. Um from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, our lesson title is Women Speak Out. Women Speak Out. Our devotional reading is taken from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. Our background scripture is taken from the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, verses 36 to 38. From Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. And from Acts chapter 1 verses, sorry, chapter 2 rather, 16 to 21 and chapter 21, 8 and 9. Our printed passage or lesson text is taken from Luke chapter 2 verses 36 to 38, Acts chapter 2 verses 16 to 21 and Acts 21, 8 and 9. Our key verse is verse is Acts chapter 2 verse 17 from the King James version it reads it shall come to pass in the last days saith the Lord that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and all your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams again from the faith pathway adult quarterly the lesson aims or Number one, examine how God called and empowered women to proclaim his message. Number two, affirm the contributions of godly women to the church's mission. And then number three, advocate for greater recognition of God's call, called rather, women in the church. Uh, Our lesson has... Three divisions after the introduction. The first is entitled Anna Serves. That's covered between Luke chapter 2, verses 36 and 38. The second is All Shall Prophesy. All Shall Prophesy. And that's covered between Acts chapter 2, verses 16 and 21. And the last is And more shall prophesy. That's covered between Acts chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. From the standard commentary, our lesson title is simply Call to Prophesy. Call to Prophesy. Very quickly, additional aims are, number one, summarize the text quoted from Joel. Number two, explain the significance of fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. And then number three, Repent of valuing the Spirit's influence in some people more than others or some types of people, women, for example, or men or uh, blacks or whites, uh, any differentiations that we care to make. uh, We are to repent of valuing them on their personhood rather than on how God is using them. So we are going to be discussing uh, the first of a series of, I believe, five lessons in which we are going to focus on uh, how God used women in the Bible to uh, accomplish his will, to prophesy, to proclaim his word. Uh, And we're going to be focusing uh, today uh, on three short passages that feature Uh, women. uh, And as we do, you know, we want to remember that uh, throughout God's revelation to man, even going back to the Old Testament, uh, he used women. Uh, We know uh, how the culture, cultures, various cultures treated women back in those days, both the Hebrew culture and the Roman, uh, Greek, and other cultures treated them Uh, as uh, certainly subordinate to men and really uh, not worthy to be heard in some cases, certainly 
uh, not in giving any kind of uh, credible testimony, but we see how God used them mightily in the Old Testament. Uh, Deborah, who was uh, not only a prophet, but a judge, uh, how he used uh, uh, Huldah and how he used Miriam as prophetesses in the Old Testament. And we're going to, again, be focusing on some that he used in the New Testament in our lesson today. Um, we're going to, uh, uh, the texts are a little disjointed, but again, the theme is how God uses these women. We need to remember as we go through the lesson that, that, that God is no respecter of person and that in Christ there's neither male nor female, neither bond nor free. We are all uh, the same in Christ. All right, so now <clears throat> we're going to read our first passage. Uh, actually, let me give a little more background before we do that. And then we'll have a, a short word of prayer, and then we'll read our first passage and move into our verse-by-verse -verse discussion. Um, the, the contrast between how God values women and how the, the pagan cultures value them uh, in the days when the Bible was written was stark. Uh, the, the men basically had the power of life and death over women. Uh, they were typically uneducated. Uh, they were typically thought of as uh, being um, just uh, the, the bearers and raisers of children while the men went out and uh, uh, had their affairs with other women in the Roman culture and in the Greek culture. Uh, and certainly not uh, regarded as being able to give any uh, anything worth hearing uh, in testimony of anything. Uh, and so uh, it, you, you may have heard the, the saying that one of the Jewish prayers was, Lord, I thank God that I'm not a woman, including in the morning prayer of a typical Jewish man, was that he thanked God that he was not a woman. Uh, but... We see how God uses women, and as a matter of fact, Christianity, I believe, was was probably the most, uh, the strongest force in uh, uh, giving women equal voices and actually uh, the equality that uh, they now share in most, at least first world countries, uh, than any other force in in history. So with that, um, let's go before the throne. Father, we do thank and praise you for uh, yet another opportunity to study your precious word, Lord. And we we thank you for keeping us in your loving care uh, in the midst of so much that's going on in our world, Lord. Uh, we know that you're fully in control, Lord. You're in control of COVID and this pandemic. Uh, you're in control of the political uh, unrest, Lord, and partisanship that we see. Uh, Lord, uh, we know that um, uh, we, we pray, Lord, uh, that your people uh, would understand the truth, uh, would live for righteousness, would speak out for righteousness, Lord, and would do those things that you uh, commanded us to do, Lord, to proclaim uh, your gospel, Lord, and your truth to this sin, sick, and dying world. And Lord, we we ask your blessings upon those who uh, have suffered as a result of this uh, this dread disease. And those who've lost loved ones, certainly we ask that you would comfort them. And we ask, Lord, that you would bring an end to this, Lord, and bring us back to some normalcy uh, in your good timing, Lord. And we thank you for, again for this uh, this lesson today. We pray that you'd give us a clearer understanding on how you use uh, women, Lord, but uh, also help us to remember that you're no respecter of person. It doesn't matter whether we're male or female, black, white, or any other color, or of any culture, Lord, you can use us to proclaim your word and the truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so again from the quarterly, the first passage or first division is entitled, Anna Serves Prophetically. That's taken from Luke chapter 2, verses 36 to 38. Let's read those verses. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. Verse 37. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayer night and day. 
And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto God, unto the, I'm sorry, unto the Lord, and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Now, um, first of all, Anna is a Greek version of the Hebrew word or name Hannah. Uh, you remember Hannah, who was Samuel's mother in the Old Testament. Um, you can read about that in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Uh, Hannah means grace or divine favor. And certainly uh, this woman uh, was, so, was properly named. Was, uh, and it, our, our lesson tells us in that 36th verse, text rather tells us in that 36th verse that she was a prophetess. A prophetess is the female version of a prophet. And what is a prophet? A prophet is one who speaks the words of God, not necessarily uh, in a foretelling way, uh, but always in a forth telling way. Uh, most likely she spoke the words of the Old Testament. We don't know. She may have predicted some things as well, being guided by the Holy Spirit, but uh, the commentators that I've read uh, understand that she most likely spoke the Old Testament words, and we'll see later, to all those who would hear and all those who look for redemption in Jerusalem. Now, it says uh, she was a widow. Uh, well, it says that she was the daughter of Phanuel, the daughter of Phanuel, and Phanuel was was no doubt a well-remembered uh, member of uh, Jerusalem or a resident of Jerusalem. Phanuel means the face of God or presence of God. And he no doubt was a righteous man who raised his daughter in the faith. Uh, he was of the tribe of Asher. Uh, it's spelled uh, A-S-E in our text, but elsewhere in the Old Testament is spelled A-S-H-E-R. And Asher was actually part of the, the northern kingdom, part of the ten northern tribes. Uh, and as we know, um, th those tribes were taken captive by the Assyrians or scattered, otherwise scattered, in 70, uh, 722 B.C. But it, apparently, uh, Anna and her uh, father or, or recent uh, ancestry uh, remained in Israel and did not uh, commingle with other peoples that the Assyrians brought in um, that uh, produced the Samaritans. So because she could trace her lineage now to the, the tribe of Asher, the Samaritans, because they were so commingled, could not trace their lineage. Now, and, and this, her hometown home uh, uh, country, if you will, or uh, tribal uh, territory was some 75 miles from where she is now in Jerusalem. And uh, it says that she was a widow of about four score and four years, or 84 years. Uh, and there's a little confusion as to whether she had been a widow for 84 years or whether she was 84 years and had been widowed after seven years of marriage. And um, I, I think, uh, and, and again, it, it's, 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 it's open for debate, but most of the commentators that I've read seem to think she was 84 years old and not well over 100 years old or about that, uh, where she had lived for 84 years after her seven years of marriage. Uh, so she's about 84 years, which was old for that day. That was old for that day. And it says she didn't depart from the temple. She was on the temple ground. She served God with fasting and prayer night and day. We're going to see how she served God in just a minute. So she is there. Whether she slept on the grounds or not, we don't know. It's possible. She could have. But her presence was so consistent there, uh, at the minimum, it was as if she uh, she did live there. She was there, uh, a, a presence probably all day, every day. 
Uh, and it says she served God with fastings and prayer. Now, those two go together. We are in a week of fasting here and uh, and praying. Uh, fasting without praying uh, is, I don't know, is pointless, I, I, I would think. Uh, we want to focus our prayers. We want to deny our our fleshly appetites so that we can concentrate more and, and focus on that which is spiritual and, and, and actually uh, demonstrate the sincerity of our prayers and our desires to God by denying our flesh. So she is praying earnestly with fasting night and day. For what? Well, verse 38 says, and she coming in in that instant. Well, let's back up and see what that instant was. Well, we'd actually have to back all the way up to verse 25 of chapter 2. Uh, and this, uh, <clears throat> this uh, the passage preceding uh, speaks of an incident where uh, the Lord has been brought, the Lord Jesus has been brought to the temple to uh, for an, or an offering to be made. This is after his circumcision, an offering to be made for him. The first child that opened the matrix of the womb, an offering was to be made for that male child, the first male child. And uh, what was required of the poor was uh, a pigeon or two turtle doves or two pigeons, and which is what uh, Joseph and Mary offered. And they ran into an old man, Simeon, who was also a prophet. And he recognized the child as the promised Messiah. And he prophesied. And, uh, and, uh, at, and he, you can read about that between verses 25 and verse 35. And, and we, we know that Mary ponders these things and lays them up in her heart. Uh, and then after this encounter with Simeon, that is when Anna comes into the temple. And she, no doubt being guided by the Spirit, as Simeon was. In fact, Simeon was told by the Spirit that he would not depart this life, his life rather, until he had seen the Lord's salvation, which he recognized in the Lord Jesus. So Anna comes in. Again, verse 38 says, And she coming in, in that instant, gave thanks likewise. As Simeon was praising the Lord, she began to join in that praise unto the Lord, and spake unto him, uh, and spake of him, rather, to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. I believe that her, fa her, her fastings and her prayer was that God would make her a more effective a spokesperson for him, uh, that she would get, that he would give her revelation, a greater understanding of his word and its application and the ability to share it with others. And that's what she did. She spake of him, that is the Lord, the Lord's Christ, the Lord's Messiah, to all them that look for redemption or salvation in Jerusalem. This word redemption could means to buy back. It can also mean to deliver, which is what salvation is. Our salvation is deliverance from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, and ultimately from the very presence of sin. Now, some commentators suggest that she may not have understood exactly uh, what type of redemption the Lord would bring, uh, whether political or military uh, redemption or salvation, which many uh, of her generation and, and, and generations before expected the Messiah to do. They expected him to come and restore the kingdom of David. And that was a, a military, political kingdom. But he came to deliver us from sin, from the power of sin. And I, we don't know, obviously, uh, 2,000 plus years later, but I happen to believe that the spirit of the Lord who gave her the insight to recognize Jesus as the Messiah also uh, must have and could have and probably did give her the insight to understand the nature of the redemption that he would bring to the world at his first advent. I'm not sure. Uh, certainly she didn't understand everything uh, his first perhaps and second advents, but I I believe that the Spirit certainly couldn't have, could have given her the understanding of 
his true mission during his first advent. So that that concludes our first passage in our first division. We're going to move on to the next one, which is entitled, uh, All Shall Prophesy. And that's taken from uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 16 to 21. So let's read those verses very quickly. And they read, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Verse 18, And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Verse 19, And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it, shall be, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I hope I said that text was taken from Acts chapter 2, verse 16 to 21 and not Luke. Uh, and we let's get the setting here. Uh, we know that... Uh, uh, the beginning of that chapter uh, describes described as the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, we know that there there was a sound of wind and rushing mighty wind, and and the, and the, the whole upper room where the disciples were, not just the eleven or twelve by this time, but uh, had come and, and 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 something lit on their shoulders like tongues of fire. We know that was the Holy Spirit that come that had come. And it filled them all, and they all began to prophesy. And they came out into the street, and they spoke in the languages of all those who had surrounded them. The crowds, they were there for Pentecost. There were uh, thousands, perhaps, in Jerusalem, many thousands, perhaps, in Jerusalem. And they all heard what the, the, the disciples were prophesying in their own tongues, in their native tongues. And we see... Uh, a very uh, brief uh, list of those uh, between verses, uh, well, let's back up to eight. It says, and, and how is it that we hear each in our own languages in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, uh, those, dwellings in those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya, adjoining Cyrene, and so forth. Uh, visitors from Rome, and so forth. Cretans. And so they heard this miraculous proclamation of the gospel in their native tongues. And there's a lot of confusion. We're not going to get into any discussion of tongues, but my understanding is uh, when tongues are spoken of in the Bible, as they are between uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14, uh, we're not talking about some ecstatic uh, utterances uh, that only um, angels or God can understand, not even the person speaking them, but we're talking about other known languages that are unknown to the speaker, that the speaker heretofore has had no ability to speak. But we're not going to get into that debate, but let's, let's understand that that is what caused Peter to respond to this crowd because some in the crowd took this miracle uh, uh, as, uh, and they began to mock, suggesting that uh, the disciples had been drinking and they were drunk and it was too early in the morning for them to have been drink, uh, be drinking. Let's look at you look at verse 15, uh, verse 14, rather 15. And then Peter responded and says, no, no, this is not uh, these men. Have, these, we have not uh, been drinking. And he tells them what it it is a sign of. And that is at least in part the fulfillment of of a prophecy of Joel, okay? A prophecy of Joel the prophet. 
we back up to 15, Peter says, for these, in, well, let me back up to 14. But Peter, standing up with the 11, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk, as ye suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, that was nine o'clock, nine a.m., but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And that's where we pick up uh, at verse, uh, uh, well, 17. We actually covered that was part of our lesson text. So he says, Joel said in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32, what Peter quotes here. Let's look at verses 17 and 18. And it shall come to pass... In the last days, that God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now, the, we are in the last days. The last days really speak of the last age when God would reveal uh, him, himself. Uh, it's, it's the last age for God's plan for humanity. Uh, the culmination of this age will be the end of his plan for humanity. And uh, we will be going into eternity. And we know this age has lasted over over 2,000 years, but it is, we are still in the last days. And he says he's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. Now, some of you know, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, God's spirit was active. However, uh, God's spirit did not permanently indwell uh, people, uh, as far as we know. Uh, may have been some exceptions, uh, but God, uh, God actually dispensed his spirit uh, upon those who uh, he had a special purpose for. He empowered them. He gave them a skill. He gave them the ability by his spirit uh, to accomplish his will. Samson, for example, had uh, superhuman strength when the spirit was upon him. Uh, we know Moses was often in the spirit. David prophesied and actually uh, even probably uh, wrote some, some of the Psalms in the spirit uh, and was actually called a prophet. And David said, don't take your spirit from me in Psalm 51, recognizing that it could be taken from him. Now, so in the Old Testament, the, the Spirit was given for purposes, for specific purposes or tasks. But now, in, this, in these last days, he's pouring out his Spirit on all flesh. And when it says all flesh, it doesn't mean anybody and everybody, any uh, uh, sinful, uh, God-rejecting person. Uh, it, it is talking about those, of course, who believe in God, first of all, and have faith to be saved. They, they are the ones who will receive his spirit and be permanently indwelt by his spirit. He says, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. They will speak my words. Okay, and those, his children, then uh, at the beginning of the church, uh, in the second chapter of Acts, to this day, believers in Christ Jesus should be speaking, should be reading, should be understanding, should be speaking God's word to others, should be proclaiming his grace, should be proclaiming the salvation that he bought, that the Lord Jesus bought for us with his blood to the world. He says, your sons and your daughters. Now, uh, and this is, this is, it, this is important because uh, he's not restricting this to, uh, just the males or even uh, certain people, uh, certain males uh, within the, the uh, if you will, religious hierarchy. But uh, to all, he's saying, to sons and daughters, males and females, they shall prophesy. And he says, your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And we know that God has revealed much to his people uh, his chosen people through dreams and through visions, uh, his spirit that his spirit is going to give 
Uh, and and he is going to be, and that's not going to be restricted to anyone, male or female, but it all will uh, have the ability to receive God's direction uh, through dreams and visions. Another thing I wanted to make mention of when he says all flesh, uh, that means Gentiles as well. You know, he's not just talking about Jews. When he says all flesh, he means Jews and Gentiles as well. And uh, means those who, uh, certainly those in the Jewish culture of that day, didn't think would be qualified to speak the words of God. So God is not uh, putting any pre-qualifications on anyone that will be able to proclaim his word. Uh, and then again, uh, he t he, when he talks about... Um, Uh, again, he, he repeats, but, or rather, he says, uh, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. That's all he's talking about, my servants, and uh, on my handmaidens, the handmaidens, those who are considered the low, low, lowest of the low, there will be no pre-qualifications for Number one, receiving of his spirit, which he's going to pour out. And number two, uh, being animated and activated and empowered by his spirit to speak his word and guided by his spirit to speak his word. Verses 19 and 20. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to, into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. Now, um, I think that uh, what Peter is uh, understanding to be the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy is just the beginning of that, uh, the pouring out of the Spirit and the pro on all and the uh, prophesying by all, that was the beginning of the fulfillment. And if you know anything about Bible prophecy, you know many times God gives a near-term fulfillment of it and then an ultimate fulfillment of it. Uh, the ultimate fulfillment of the prophecy he gave to uh, Abraham, for example, that uh, in him or through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed was in Jesus Christ, the only way all the nations and the people of families of the earth could be blessed was through the salvation offered by his descendant in the flesh, the Lord Jesus. So um, this is a uh, partial fulfillment of what, what uh, they are witnessing. What's described in verses 19 and 20 is yet to come. And I believe during pr just prior to the second coming of the Lord Jesus, we can read about that. In uh, Luke chapter 21, verses 25 to 28. And just, just to read a little bit of that, beginning at verse 25 in Luke chapter 21, and it says, And there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth, distress of nations and perplexity of seas and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For powers, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And this is talking about, and it says, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So uh, I believe that uh, this second part of Joel's prophecy is yet to be fulfilled just prior to the second coming of the Lord. Let's move on to verse 21. And it says, And it shall come to pass, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is true now. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in faith, and that means they, they understand who he is. He is God incarnate. And what he did, he came and died for our sin in our place, for our sins, and by his shed blood. Uh, through faith in what he did for us, we have redemption, we have salvation, we have deliverance from our penalty and uh, from the penalty, from the power, and ultimately from the very presence of sin. When it says, shall be saved, 
It means shall be delivered. All who have and all who will believe on him shall will and have been saved. Have and will be saved, I should say. And then we're going to move into our third and final division uh, of the lesson, which is entitled, And More Shall Prophesy. More Shall Prophesy. We're going to uh, move over into Acts and look at verses, uh, Acts 21, verses 8 and 9. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which were, which did prophesy, rather, which did prophesy. Now, Paul is um, returning from his second missionary journey, and Luke, of course, is a traveling companion of Paul's, and certainly a great uh, scribe or author, because he he actually uh, wrote the Gospel of, of Luke, as we know it, and also Acts. And uh, so he is describing uh, what uh, what they they did here. They actually uh, <clears throat> they be, <clears throat> just stopped over in uh, uh, in Caesarea, where where uh, Philip, one of the original. Uh, Seven who was called to help out at Jerusalem because uh, the the Hellenistic uh, Jews were complaining, uh, or I'm sorry, the, uh, some of the widows were complaining that they were being ignored. They weren't being served like the Jewish uh, widows, I guess. And so um, you remember the apostles said, look ye out, seven men uh, full of the spirit and of wisdom. Uh, we can read about that in uh, Acts chapter 6. And Philip was one of those, full of the Spirit. Uh, we know that uh, he was called away uh, to uh, encounter a uh, uh, an Ethiopian, uh, a servant of Candace, the treasurer for Candace, the, the queen. And now he's some, some 60 miles northwest of Jerusalem. And uh, even though he started out as a deacon, his ministry has changed. He's now become a... I guess a full-time evangelist. He certainly evangelized the the eunuch uh, who was on his way back from Jerusalem to Ethiopia. Um, you can read about that in in uh, Acts chapter eight, verses uh, twenty-six to forty. Uh, and no doubt he has uh, he's he's pretty well known in Caesarea, and uh, and we learn here uh, because he's an evangelist. And uh, I'm certain full of the Spirit. We know that uh, Stephen, the first martyr that we know of in the church, uh, moved away from, uh, he not necessarily moved away from his ministry as just a deacon serving tables, but was full of the Spirit and, and of power and testified. And, and actually his, his testifying of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, caused him, was, was, uh, resulted in him being stoned in Acts chapter 7. And we see here in, in verse 9 that Philip, this Philip, had four daughters who were virgins or unmarried. And this is a very simple verse, and it said, they which did prophesy, they did prophesy, which simply means they spoke the word of God to others. Uh, and when I say others, not just to other believers, I'm I'm confident if Philip was an evangelist, his daughters were doing evangelical work as well and speaking the words of God, uh, speaking forth uh, his his word, written word, and what was being revealed uh, at that time in the uh, in the uh, of the New Testament uh, to. Uh, those who would hear, who those who desired to understand the truth, and those who would uh, would have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, resulting, and so uh, again, the the uh, overall purpose of the the lesson was to uh, 
uh, to show us how God used women. And, and uh, he, uh, uh, has, has, as I said, it says, no respect a person can use anyone. Uh, and he does not limit what he can do through anyone. If you go back and read uh, what he did through Deborah, the judge, uh, and, and, and this is to show, again, that there's no, uh, um, he doesn't make a distinction because of our sex. He doesn't make a distinction because of our race. Uh, tradition has it that the uh, Ethiopian uh, that was saved and baptized uh, went back and uh, began a, uh, the spread of the gospel in Ethiopia. Now, we don't, we don't hear of, of Philip or his daughters any, any, anymore in the Bible, any place else. But we, this, this, these few verses here are sufficient to let us know that both Philip and his daughters were being used of God to advance the gospel. And we want uh, not only to make ourselves fully available, regardless of whether we're male or female, uh, black or white or any other color, uh, once we uh, are called, we want to answer the call faithfully. We want to proclaim God's word. We want to proclaim the gospel. Uh, and uh, we want to be certainly faithful in doing that uh, whenever God gives us opportunity. I, I just on a personal note, uh, was raised in a fairly traditional Baptist church where women never came into the pulpit. And I don't know, I guess at, at one time I thought, well, maybe that was appropriate. Uh, it wasn't until well into my life that I realized how powerfully God can use women of our day, ministers, to teach and to preach his word. And uh, if God doesn't put any restrictions on who he gives uh, uh, his spirit to and the ability to proclaim his word, who is man? What is man to do that? So I know that they're very gifted women uh, in, uh, in, in the church today. And I pray that uh, we would all encourage them as one of our aims was. We would all encourage them in their gifts to prophesy as the Lord leads them. So with that, I'm going to read uh, just the last paragraph of the conclusion from the, the standard commentary. And it says the focus uh, rather, and that's rather than on the uh, the, the the different stories that we read about the women, uh, the unmarried uh, sisters, the age of uh, Anna, uh, those uh, who uh, Joel prophesied he would pour his spirit out on. It says, the focus rather is on using one's giftedness in answering God's call to ministry. As one observer put it, when the church is working properly, every woman as well as every man will be using at least one spiritual gift in ministry to others in the body of Christ. And we can read about those gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 11, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. So we pray that uh, we've gotten a little bit more out of this lesson than perhaps we understood in focusing on what God did through some women. We're going to continue in this series for the next uh, four weeks. May God bless you and may he keep you until such time as we come together again.